the review that Variety gave us when we first went on the air in September of 1966. Star Trek won't work. What was your impetus for this project? What, where, where did it start? In November of last year, I approached Dad about the idea of doing a documentary on Spock as a part of the celebration of the anniversary of the original series. And the minute I suggested this to Dad, he was in. When word came out today that actor Leonard Nimoy had died, the president said, I love Spock. I started acting about eight years old and suddenly decided that I liked it enough to want to make a career of it, so I came to California in 1949. I loved Leonard. Leonard and I came from a lot of similar backgrounds. He was a multifaceted individual. He was never just spoke to me even growing up. He had a ubiquitous curiosity about everything going on in the world. Prior to Star Trek, I never had a job that lasted longer than two weeks. Never, two weeks. People ask me what it was like living with Spock. And for the most part during that period, he'd come home at night, eat his dinner, memorize his lines, and then just go to sleep. He was trying so hard to get this career going. It took a toll on his family life. That he was occasionally Leonard-like, but mostly he was Spock. Everyone feels a little bit like an outsider. I would argue the most interesting people seem to. I think people recognize themselves in him. One of the things that I you know, really respect about um, your dad was his love and affection for the fans. to create a character who leaves a mark on the society that strikes a chord that resonates. Leonard Nimoy did that. Leonard was a self-made renaissance man. He made the world stand up and listen. Fascinating. If there was a word you would use to sum up or describe my dad, what would that be for you? Noble. Dignity. Artist. Integrity. Humble. The first word that does come to mind is loving. Love. It's definitely just love. I have been and always shall be your friend. Congratulations on, the, on this documentary. I was telling you backstage how much I loved it. And what I want to start off by asking you right away was something that we talked about briefly, which is this idea of rediscovering the rediscovering your family through this documentary and the way that a lot of people rediscover their family when they grow out of that period where they don't want to be around their family anymore, which is around like 30, 40, 50 years old, you start realizing how important they are and how much respect and admiration a lot of times you have for your elders. Did that come about while making this? Well, yeah, I mean, we were kind of reliving uh, my life during that period, during the 60s, because we were getting so much material uh, into the editing room to look at, to consider for the film. A lot of stuff I'd never re really even seen before. We were getting photos from fans uh, who had uh, pictures of my family that I don't even remember sitting for. So we were getting a lot of material that kind of just, uh, kind of like, you know, reliving the past, going through the 60s, going through that whole period with my dad. It's so interesting that when you lose a loved one, you don't lose just the, the person who is sick at the end of their life. You lose the whole, the whole journey, the whole gamut. And um, the legacy of what my father left behind, which we went through painstakingly, was like really reliving my life from beginning, you know, the early days of Star Trek all the way through the end, so it was Do you was mean a, that, you, sorry, do you mean that when you, you lose the things from behind, do you mean because you can't ask them about it anymore? You can't sort of rediscover it with them? Well, yeah, it's like, you know, we, we were not really always living in the past. I mean, my dad was very much a man of the present, a man of the moment, and living in the moment and being in the moment. This is why he's such an incredible artist. He was always moving forward. Uh, and we were really present with him in the end of his life. He was very devoted to family. So we were not necessarily, you know, um, immersing ourselves in Star Trek lore and phenomenon during that period, the last four or five years of his life. So then when we lost him, he had succumbed to COPD, this, this lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, he was very sick and slowing down, and he was a very different man than who he was. 
But then, after we were adjusting to life without Leonard, and we were back in the editing room, and we we're looking at all this material, it's like the whole tidal wave of his life was coming back to me, and my experience with him was coming back to me. And, and yes, there was a period of time as a teenager where I was trying to separate from the family, create my own identity, go in my own direction, rebel against my father. Um, but then later on in my life, I wanted to do more creative things like my dad and rejoined him and he helped me transition, in fact, from practicing law to becoming a director. Um, so in that way, I was coming back in the fold, but it was just a really interesting experience immersing myself in this, this phenomenal career and particularly in the life and legacy of Mr. Spock. Did the immersion ever change your perspective on him and your family in the 60s? Uh, it just gave me a, a greater appreciation for what we went through, frankly. I mean, it really was a, a wonderful time. It was an interesting time in American pop culture to begin with. Um, it was a tumultuous time in terms of our, the family life. We, we were celebrating the, finally, the breakthrough of my dad. He had a long career in TV, mostly, uh, struggling for many, many years. He, he came to L.A. in 1949 and met Mr. Spock in 1964. So... Um, so this is about 15 years later. It was really 17 years when they went back into production for Star Trek. And there was a lot of struggles. And we re my sister and I really remember those times. Um, and so that when he hit it big, it was like hitting the lotto. It was a very exciting time for us. It was also very challenging because very quickly after the show aired, the, the fan base mobilized themselves and we were very aware of them. We, we were, I talk about in the film the fact that 16 Magazine accidentally printed our home address as the mailing address for the fan mail, and we were inundated with this stuff. And fans started showing up, and we couldn't even be on the street with Dad without him being mobbed by fans. So it was, it was, a, very, it was a new challenge, it was a new life for us. It's so interesting that Spock took off the way that it did, when at the same time it also feels like your father may have been the most, I don't wanna say the most dedicated, but the most spiritually invested in Spock than uh, most of the other actors on the show. And that's not to say they weren't spiritually invested. I just mean that, you know, he came up with this while on set. He seemed really invested in the emotions behind the character of, of Spock. Well, you know, he invested a lot of his personal experience, in fact, in the character of Spock. Um, and he was lucky that he had Bill Shatner to play off of because he could be more introspective as Spock, which was the way he was originally written. It can be very challenging for an actor to play a guy who doesn't show a lot of emotion. But it doesn't mean he doesn't, it, it doesn't, mean he doesn't have emotion. He does. He has plenty of emotion, which we talk about in the, in the documentary. He has emotional control, and that's the inner dynamic, the tension going on. But the thing about Spock for my dad was that, and he reminded me of this, not long before he passed away was that Spock was the only alien on the core crew of the Enterprise, on that bridge. It's a diverse crew, but he's the only alien. And as such, his objective is to try to find a way to integrate himself with his human colleagues, to give the best that he had to offer uh, for the benefit of the crew, because they're all after one goal, which is to explore the universe and kind of benefit mankind or, or alien kind. It's an intergalactic crew at that point. This is exactly what he went through as a young man living in Boston. He was an outsider. He was the son of Russian immigrants. He was in a very defined uh, immigrant neighborhood, the West End of Boston, and his objective was to find a way to get out of that and integrate himself with American society as a whole, which he did by leaving at age 18 to come out to, uh, west to California. So there's a lot of Leonard in Spock. There's a lot of his personal experience invested in Spock. And I think that's why he was so successful in making Spock such a rich and dynamic character with this inner life. And I think also one of the reasons that he never seems to resent the success of Spock. I think a lot of people who get a character like that, that become totally iconic and tend to sort of define an actor's entire career, they become somewhat resentful of that at some point because they want to branch off and do something else. Where it seems like your father, whether it was the TV show or the movies or directing the movies, was always very sincerely invested in the character of Spock and in no way ever looked down on it or thought that it was sort of holding him back. Well, I mean, that is true, in fact, but there was a little uh, kind of a, a, an anomaly to that situation in that my dad did publish a biography in the mid-70s entitled I Am Not Spock. <laughs> and a lot of the fans took that to mean that uh, I'm, I don't like Spock, I'm being, you know, uh, categorized as Spock, I'm being typecast as Spock, I can't get another job, I, I, I'm so much more as an actor. 
uh, was completely misunderstood, and the fan base was mobilized, and they were angry because there was no new Star Trek, except for the animated series. There was nothing new about Star Trek coming out in the 70s, and a lot of the fans believed that was because Leonard Nimoy simply would not play Spock anymore. He refused to. And he's, my dad spent most of his career explaining that title away that he was trying to simply tell you people that he's not actually Spock. <laughs> He's an actor playing a role because people would confuse him on the street. But he loved Spock. He revered Spock. He was grateful to Spock. Spock opened up all this opportunity for him. And you're right. And, and to the point where he was able to parlay that into directing Star Trek features. Uh, and started this whole directing career. So, yeah, he was very close to the character. And he's repeatedly said if he only had one character to play, what would that be? What would his choice be? It would obviously be Spock, because he had such an affinity for the character. I have to ask, how often do you find yourself having to say, I am not Spock? Because you do have an uncanny resemblance to your father. No, I can't, I can't do it justice, frankly. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting to note that 20 years later, he wrote an autobiography entitled, I Am Spock to try to kind of like, you know, uh, bookend that whole experience, uh, to try to, to show the fan base that he's really grateful and really proud of what he had accomplished with that character. But do people sometimes think that you look like your father or think that, you look, that you're Spock? Well, only when people meet me. I mean, no one on the street says, God, you look like Leonard Nimoy. They never <laughs> say that to me. No. But when people meet me, they go, oh, okay, yeah, no, I see it now. I see the resemblance. What were you most surprised to learn about your father when you started interviewing people that he worked with or people that sort of revere him now in the new movies that work, you know, they work with him. Simon Pegg works with him for like a day or two and sort of Zach Quinto, but they revere him. They love him. What were you most surprised to learn from all these interviews? Well, it was really from those interviews with the new crew of the Enterprise under the new J.J. Abrams reincarnation of Star Trek. We went to... Uh, uh, to Vancouver while they were shooting Star Trek Beyond, and, we were, and, they, and they bent over backwards to really arrange everybody's schedule so that we could meet with everybody and talk to them about my dad. And the thing that, that just blew me away that, um, was that they repeatedly, each one individually, talked about the impact my father had on the whole project, the whole process, because he participated with them in Trek 09 and to a much lesser degree, to degree in, in Into Darkness. But they felt that so validated by his participation um, so inspired by him. They all had little anecdotes about interacting with my dad. Um, and that his, the impact that he had on them was so profound that they, they told me repeatedly that they still, even though he was no longer with them, he, they very much felt his presence, his spirit, his energy, while they were making um, Star Trek Beyond. Uh, that they still felt that they were being inspired by the legacy that he had left behind. It was so powerful. And their respect and love for him and the love they felt from him to them was so profound that it was still with them even in the making of this last motion picture. Do you think that comes from his sort of deep, profound appreciation for the role and, and, and the subject matter? Yes. I mean, my dad was very proud of the fact that he is the only surviving character from the original pilot of Star Trek, which they shot in beginning in 1964. The only crew member to survive, the only character to survive that pilot was Leonard Nimoy's Mr. Spock. The only character to appear in the J.J. Abrams incarnation of Trek from the original cast was Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock. He took incredible pride in having been in, in Star Trek through that entire trajectory from beginning to the end to where we are now with, with these new Star Trek films. So um, that, I think, is one of the reasons that they really felt that kind of energy, that, that pridefulness, the fact that he really was a spiritual source for Star Trek, that he carried the torch of Star Trek all the way through from beginning to end. And he took great personal pride in that. What was your relationship to Star Trek like before you started making this documentary? Because there's this great sequence in the film where you sort of go to your first Star Trek convention, which was hard for me to believe that that's your first Star Trek convention after being Spock's son. But if it is, I'm curious what your relationship to Star Trek was before making this documentary. Well, it, it was uh, kind of on, a, on an up and down ride. I mean, it had a lot to do with my relationship with my father, which we talk about in the film, in the documentary, um, had a lot of ups and downs. And uh, so my relationship to Spock kind of paralleled that. It's like when I was having trouble with my dad, I really was not that, uh, I didn't feel that much affection for Star Trek. I mean, 
I would have a lot of situations where I would be having trouble with my dad, and we, we were two very strong-willed individuals, and it's very typical for fathers and sons to come in conflict. But after having a knockdown, drag-out fight, I would oftentimes go to, as an example, to the, the cleaners to pick up my shirts, and the guy would recognize my last name and start waxing eloquently about wonder, what a wonderful father I must have, how wonderful Leonard Nimoy was, how Leonard Nimoy saved his life when he was in college, how Leonard Nimoy did this and that, and it's like, dude, just give me my shirts. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, I just... You don't know him like I do. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know what I just went through 20 minutes ago. So uh, that was very difficult. Uh, you know, th that, was a, that was very challenging. The thing about the conventions was I really shied away from that because um, the fact is I need to create my own identity and be my own man. And when I'm at the convention, I'm just Leonard Nimoy's son, and I'm watching, you know, all this massive adulation, which I've seen all my life. I mean, I know he's got fans. I know they fervently love Leonard and Spock. I, I know all that. I don't have to be reminded of that repeatedly. So I did. This is what celebrities mean when they say my kids keep me grounded. Yeah. Like the kids don't want anything to do with this shit. I mean, I know the man and, and I know who he really is and I know his foibles and I know that he's a human being like the rest of us. He has shortcomings. Uh, most of the people, most of the fans at those conventions simply don't know him that way, and that's fine, and I'm happy for them to have that perception of my dad. I was with him uh, in 2011 in Chicago, which was his final convention appearance, um, but, but last year was the first Las Vegas annual major mecca convention that they have uh, for Star Trek, um, and we filmed that, which we include in the documentary. Again, because it, I just was not comfortable being there um, as my dad's son. Last year I was there doing research for a film and I was there this year promoting my film. I have a reason to be there. I, I have something to contribute to the legacy of Star Trek, something that's my own, uh, my, you know, my own uh, participation in the phenomenon of Star Trek and I feel like I've earned my place at the table so that I can go there and enjoy it with a purpose, with a meaning, with a project that I can share with fans and so it's a whole different experience. Did working on this film help you kind of understand or grapple with, if you had to, your father as the icon and as your father and sort of bringing, bridging these two rather than having them be sort of completely separate? Because it sounds like you, have a, you would sort of compartmentalize them a little bit growing up. Yeah, I mean, we do, there is a balance in this film where we deal with all of it. Um, we, the film originally started off as a collaboration with my father and it was going to be Spock-centric. It was going to be wall-to-wall, -wall, the history and, and, the, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the life and the creation of Mr. Spock, the evolution of Spock, why Spock has resonated for half a century. My dad made it very clear that he didn't want it to be a Leonard Nimoy project. This is not the Leonard Nimoy story. He had a great sense of humility and didn't need to blow his own horn. After he died, it became clear from the outpouring of emotion for not only Mr. Spock, but the loss of Leonard Nimoy, this, the actor, the Renaissance man, the humanitarian, that we needed to expand the film to include his life and legacy. And then there was a lot of people who supported the idea. Most notably, my stepmother said, you know what, you should include your own journey, your own perspective, because that's what will make the film unique to you. I mean, there's so many great documentary filmmakers out there. They can do a great job on the life and legacy of Mr. Spock and Leonard Nimoy. Nobody can bring my own sensibility, my own perspective to this film. Um, and so the film is really those three elements which we balance. We do talk about the iconic nature of Mr. Spock, and at the same time, we also delve into Leonard the Man and, uh, and the life of, and my life with Leonard and Mr. Spock. My, my life with my father, my life with Spock, my life being in a celebrity family, the challenges of being in a celebrity family, and the, challenging, the challenges of, of having conflict with your father, which is not that unusual for people. I talk about that. The only unique aspect of that part of my life with my dad is he happens to be adored by fans all over the world. Yeah, I, I'm probably in one of many conflicts with my father while we're talking right now, and I don't even know it, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I'm curious if the film helped you sort of bridge all of, all, all of that, because there is something strange about being a, the child of a celebrity. There are many of those, but there are very few children of icons, celebrities who have like one iconic role that completely define them and almost even a, a, a culture, you know? There's like Mark Hamill, maybe, uh, for, for Luke Skywalker, Spock. Because I don't even know if William Shatner is necessarily defined by that one iconic role as Captain Kirk, you know? He wasn't the sort of defining poster of Star Trek, and I think Spock was. 
Well, it's because of Spock's otherness is different, you know, the different nature of his character, the look of his character. I mean, in the course of the interview with Simon Pegg, he said that one of the reasons Spock is so iconic is because he's so easily recognizable. He's got the haircut, he's got the eyebrows, he's got the ears, boom, you got Spock. And this is the thing about the film that we do deal with the iconic nature. There's so many people out there who know who Spock is. They've seen, they know what he looks like. They can identify Spock. But not that many people necessarily know why he has resonated with so many people. What is it about Spock? And that's a, a big part of what this film is about. We want to educate people who don't know anything about Spock as to who he is. And we also want to give, you know, Trek fans, for lack of a better term, their Spock fix. I mean, I love to be inundated with the, what I think is the best of Spock. And, and I think we deliver that to people. Absolutely, 100%. There's some amazing Spock footage, and as I told you before, some amazing early Leonard Leonard Nimoy footage uh, from his from his early films, which I hadn't seen any of. This like strapping, handsome young guy doing his best Brando performance. It's amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about his uh, singing career in the seventies? Because I actually liked one or two of the songs, not the Bilbo Baggins song, even though that was fun to listen to. But a couple of the songs had like sort of Leonard Cohen esque vibe to them. Yeah, you know, there, he recorded four or five albums, a lot of material. It, it's just, it's a, it's a wonder to me to this day. Uh, some of it is really lovely, easy listening, um, great stuff. I love it. I, I mean, I immersed myself in this stuff, you know, for the first time in, in decades. I'm listening to his stuff in the car on the way to the editing room. Uh, and some of it really is quite lovely. But there's a lot of it that's kitschy, a lot of it that is like, what were you thinking? And Bilbo Baggins is one of those things that we include in the film. I mean, this, this is when, you know, my sister and I turned to each other and it's like, Leonard Nimoy, what planet are you on? This is ridiculous. You know, because we just thought it was so, it was just um, not really in keeping with popular culture and what we were used to. Was he on the planet of this is what the record company sort of asked me to do for this song? Or was Bilbo Baggins like a total Leonard Nimoy sort of like passion project. Well, it, not a passion project. It was written by the producer who was working with them, and they did a lot of kitschy things like that. And, then, and this is Star Trek, by the way. I mean, there's some serious, dead-on, fine drama, excellent performances in Star Trek, and then there's some stuff that is tongue-in-cheek, wink of the eye, you know, a piece of the action. They go back in time to gangster Chicago and, in the 30s. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's kitschy. It's, it's comedic, and uh, so is Dad's recording career. It kind of mirrors that. Some of it is just wonderful, beautiful, Leonard Cohen-esque, uh, you know, easy-listening Leonard Nimoy, and I really dig it. And some of it's like, God, this is so out there. It's so, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum. And we, we pay, I think we pay tribute to both sides of that recording career spectrum. And Bilbo Baggins, we, the fans were emphatic about us, including Eddie in the film, uh, <laughs> even though I think it's a bizarre turn of events for, for Dad, but it's in there. And because and, uh, we wanted to cover as much as we could. And one of the things that you also touch on is the sort of competitive nature between Shatner and, and your dad, as your dad sort of ended up becoming the kind of poster for Star Trek or the character that people gravitated towards more. How long did that competitive uh, aspect of their personalities last? I know, they're, you know they talk to each other later on and, 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 and converse, but did they remain competitive even through the movie years? Yeah, I don't think it ever really ended. I mean, these are, guys, these are a couple of guys who are like brothers. I mean, they're only, they were born just a few days apart. I think Bill is two days older than my dad. And um, I think... He held it over him. <laughs> what's that? He held he it over, held it over. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you know, Bill is still ticking and he's still pushing it hard. I was just saw him at the convention here in New York. Um, it's amazing to watch him. His motor just keeps going. I think there was a lot of competition between them. Um, there was a lot of talk about the conflict between Dad and Bill. The fact of the matter is you had two very strong personalities who cared a lot about their characters. I mean, you put Gene Roddenberry in that mix too. You have another very strong personality and there was a lot of conflict. But the fact is that on screen, what you see between Bill and Leonard, between Kirk and Spock, is amazing. The chemistry is amazing. It's all there. We've benefited from that conflict, from these two guys who, who you know, butted heads maybe off camera, but on camera were pure professionals professional and, and, and one-upping each other, frankly. And Dad talks about the fact in the film, we talk a lot in, in one of the interviews that we've included about the fact that uh, when Bill came along with his kind of extroverted, flamboyant, romantic view of what Kirk should be, enabled Dad to be more introspective, more, more internalized uh, Spock character so that they could really play off each other. And the chemistry is amazing. I mean, George Takei comments on that. It's just fabulous the way they work together. 
And at one point, Shatner says that the creator of the show told him that, you know, sure, people, the, the more famous Spock gets, the more famous you're going to get, and the show is going to get as well. And he seems like he's okay with that. But how, I'm curious how he was when your dad started directing the movies. Was there, was there any, any talk of, like, how the two of them played off each other as a director and star? Well, you know, Bill got his when he directed Star Trek V, and, and Bill got his. Um, <laughs> in more ways than one. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you look at Star Trek III, which is a Bill feature, it, he carries that film, I think he's excellent in it. I think he's excellent. Uh, the work they did together in Star Trek IV, also directed my, by my dad, Bill is fantastic. He's superb. So I really think he, they, they collaborated. They were at a good time in their lives together. Um, they, it was really important to them that they turn in a good project. I mean, the fact of the matter is that I would ask my dad, I said, well, when you were in conflict with Bill, how is it that, uh, you know, that we, well, I look at what's on the screen and it's, it's just superb. And he said they really were professionals at what they did. They really left anything personal that was going on, they just left behind. And when they were in front of the camera, they were on. They were in their character and they were doing their jobs. Absolutely. Uh, let's turn it over to the audience for some questions. Does anyone have any questions out there? Yeah, I was going to ask about the album, if you didn't bring it up. Uh, Music from Outer Space is one of our personal favorites at home. But I also wanted to ask, uh, in the documentary trailer, they talked about him being a Renaissance man. And I wondered, if he hadn't have taken the career path that he did, uh, what other thing might have he contributed to the world? Wow, uh, it's hard to say, but then again, if you look at his career, you can see where he was going, uh, because the fact is that this is a guy who was an artist uh, and very hungry to achieve. You know, my dad had a lot of determination to succeed at his career, uh, and he expressed himself artistically in a lot of different ways. The photography work, the recording work, which we talked about, uh, the directing work, um, you know, there was so many things that my dad could do. Uh, and the acting work, even if he, if Star Trek had not come along, my dad would have been acting. That was his life's passion. That's, he was true to himself. I think this is a big part of his legacy, that people should do whatever it is that their heart, you know, demands that they do, that what they want, what their, what their bliss is, follow their bliss. You know, when my father told his um, parents that he wanted to become an actor, they were grief stricken. He uses those words in our film grief-stricken, because his older brother went to MIT and became a chemical engineer for Johnson & Johnson. This is what his parent, my dad's parents wanted. They were Russian immigrants. They wanted doctors and lawyers to fulfill their idea of the American dream. It's saying that he wanted to become an actor was like saying, I want to run off and join the circus. They just hated the idea. But he was true to himself, and this is another big part of his legacy. He never set out to create an iconic character. He never set out to be a celebrity. He simply wanted to really um, pursue his craft to the best of his ability and to become successful in at least supporting himself and satisfying himself in terms of what he wanted to do with his career. So I think that even if we had not seen Leonard Nimoy's Mr. Spock in Star Trek, he would have popped up as something else sooner, you know, sooner or later along the way that I think would have made him a success. Now, I have to ask you, you know, you started as a, as a lawyer, right? You left being a lawyer to become a director. You worked with your father to sort of learn the trade, and you've directed a lot of television, a lot of episodic television. This is your first feature film, right? What was it like for you transitioning from episodic television to a feature film? I mean, the delineations of roles in episodic television is, are like pretty clear. You have the writer, then you step in as the director, and then it goes to the editors, and the writers kind of take over working with the, the, the editors a lot of time. But on this, you are writing, directing, editing all, all throughout the whole process. Well, you know, it really depends. I mean, the, the TV uh, industry is a writer-producer medium. It's driven by writers and producers. They have control. It's their show. However, that being said, if, as a director, you're involved early on in the production of a TV show, as, for example, I was on The Outer Limits, which is an episode I made with my father. We were remaking an episode that he had appeared in in the early 60s. Um, you, you can have, there's much more leeway. We had a lot of creativity, my dad and I, um, because it was a new show. They were just finding their, their footing. Uh, they weren't established yet. And we had a lot of creative control. But when you get on, for example, the first shows I directed were Star Trek The Next Generation when I was in, I don't even remember, I think it was season six. They've got a clamp on how they want that show to look and how they want it to, to feel and appear and the camera angles, the, the, you know, everything about it. The characters know their parts. There's very little you can do. So you have much less creativity. In making this film, uh, For the Love of Spock, yeah, we had a full gamut. And what really gave us the creative license to do what we wanted to do, that is, myself and the other producers, was the fact that we, we went through the crowdfunding route through Kickstarter 
uh, to raise the financing to begin to make the film. Because of that, we didn't have a distributor or a studio telling us or approving our script or having their say about what the film should look like. We made the film that we wanted to make, but we also got a lot of feedback from people in the industry uh, looking at the film, giving us comments about the film. I mean, I, you, you know, I'm so close to it. I had a great production crew. I had a great editorial crew. Uh, and I relied on their opinions. You know, these are people I trusted. But I also had people like Nick Meyer, writer-director for Star Trek Features, and now involved with a new Star Trek uh, project, uh, coming in and giving us feedback and looking at a cut of the film. And I had Bill Prady, co-creator from The Big Bang Theory, whose uh, opinion I really valued, coming in and giving me feedback on the film. So, yes, we had much more creative license, but we have a responsibility to make sure that we're delivering a product that people are going to find interesting and acceptable. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Hey Adam, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, two questions. So my first one is, uh, was there anything interesting that you got to learn about your father while uh, making the documentary? And then the second one would be, um, was there any parts that didn't actually make it into the movie that you wish would have been in there? Well, plenty of parts didn't make it in the movie. What was your first question? Oh, what did you? What was the interesting uh, things that you learned about your father while doing the? Movie? Oh well, one of the things I learned about him was the incredible amount of material he managed to generate over the course of his artistic career. I mean, if you look at the Internet Movie Database online and you look up Leonard Nimoy, the list just goes on and on and on. It's the TV work, the film work, um, it's the theater work he did, it's the voiceover work he did, the recording career, the photography books. I mean, this guy just produced a voluminous amount of material. And the fact that he directed Three Men and a Baby. Sorry. And, and Three Men and a Baby, absolutely. <laughs> That's a pin that was a high point of his career. That was one of the pinnacles of his career. I mean, this, this is, it was a great movie. Everything was, just fell into place for that movie. I mean, this is a guy who had just a tremendous amount of talent and ability. And, and the interesting thing for me is that this is a guy who barely finished high school. And he could do anything. This is why I wanted to become an attorney in part, because I could do something that he could not or did not do, which was go to college and, go, and get a postgraduate degree. That was a big impetus for me to create my own identity. I could do these things. I enjoyed doing these things. And Leonard could not. Um, but he just, he had a... He was an incredible, uh, talented guy with um, an, a very fine mind for a guy who was, had so little formal education. And that's what really kind of blew my mind about, uh, about you know, v visiting all these various aspects of these things that he had achieved in his lifetime. And the things that we left on the cutting room floor, you wouldn't believe what we left on the cutting room floor. I mean, some things that people know, you know, we left uh, things like the Transformers voiceover he did, um, the, um, the Fringe appearance he did. Uh, we left a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor. One of the things that we left that I fought so hard to get in the film, it just didn't work, was a role that he played immediately after Star Trek and Mission Impossible. He was in two seasons of Mission Impossible. He went on to, we all went to Spain to shoot a, a Western. It wasn't even a B Western, it was a C Western. It was terrible, but he was excellent in it. He played the heavy, uh, he had a beard, he looked great in buckskin, he looked great on a huge horse, he had a special sawed off shotgun that he used, or rifle that he used. He was a killer, and his name was Miller, and he was a badass mofo, and he was awesome. But I just, we just couldn't fit this it in the movie? film. This was a movie? I'm sorry? This was a movie? A movie called Catlow. It starred Yul Brenner, and um, it, was, it was just not very good, but it was, <laughs> but he was, it, it was not good, but he was excellent, and I loved him in it. It was a great experience for the family to be together in Spain while he was making this movie. We tried, but we just couldn't, it just stopped the film, and we, and it, we have to leave it on the cutting room floor. I think we have time for one more question, right here in the front. Uh, hi, Adam. Uh, hi. When I was 10 years old, I had a, a thrilling moment meeting your father. He was at a um, department store, now defunct. It was called EJ Corvettes from Korean veterans who had put it together. And he had signed his album. And I was 10 years old, and my father took me. And I didn't buy the album. He didn't care. He was so nice. He just signed whatever you gave him. And it, it was very touching. Um, my question is, uh, what was his affiliation with... Symphony Space uptown. I believe there's an area named for him up there. And I also heard he was a very religious man. And if he was, could you expand on that? And how did he work his work schedule with the long Hollywood hours around it? 
Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, Symphony Space uh, in, in Uptown uh, in the 90s off of Broadway was um, a theater, and they played a lot of classic films, but they were in need of renovation. And as a way of giving back to the arts, my dad and my stepmother, Susan, contributed to their fundraising campaign significantly, obviously, because they named the theater after him. Coincidentally, this is where our film will be opening here in New York at Symphony Space, the Leonard Nimoy Thalia Theater uh, on Friday with For the Love of Spock. Um, so he had a, just a deep connection. And my, and my dad had an apartment here in New York. He loved New York. He was on Broadway here in New York. And he just wanted to give something back to the arts. So that's how, that's his affiliation with the theater. Uh, my father, interestingly enough, I, don't, I wouldn't characterize him as a religious man. He was very culturally in tune with Judaism and his Yiddish background. Uh, he did a lot of, of, voice, of, of voiceover work of audiobooks, uh, Yiddish short stories, uh, involved with, with uh, Jewish theater. Uh, he was um, a patron of the uh, Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. I mean, he was really connected to his Jewish roots culturally. But his parents were Orthodox Jews, and as a part of his, I think, sort of rebellion, I mean, I was bar mitzvahed, but he was not, he didn't necessarily attend synagogue on any regular basis. However, interestingly enough, in the latter part of the last years of his life, he and I would oftentimes go to Friday night services together because it was a nice bonding experience. We were connected to Beit Teshuva, which is a Jewish recovery house in West LA that he was a patron of. Uh, and that I'm very much connected to, because uh, we were both in recovery. Uh, we talk about that in the film, and, and we like to uh, go to services together. It was a bonding experience between the two of us, um, and it was a way for us to, to just set aside a day out of the week to come together, to be together, uh, to pray together, and um, I was really lucky to have that time with him. Now, I gotta ask before I let you go, uh, you made a film about your father. Have you thought about what he would say upon seeing it? Well, yeah, I think he would say, <laughs> I think he would, what he would say to me was what he said after we showed him a cut of the iRobot episode we made for the Adel Image, which I directed him in, which was, he said to me, uh, I'll never forget, he said, um, I said, Dad, what'd you think? He said, I wish I had directed that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was his way of giving me a, an incredible compliment because he was so pleased with what we had accomplished. That's what we call a father's compliment. That yeah. is a father's compliment. <laughs> exactly true, Ricky. Thank you. Uh, I think he'd be very pleased with what we what we have uh, accomplished and achieved because we set out very specific with specific goals in mind. They changed over time. It had evolved over time, but we stayed on task. We stayed true to the theme. We we really tried hard to balance these three. Um, themes that we're working with Spock, Leonard, and Adam and Spock and Leonard. Um, I think he'd really be impressed with, with that, the fact that we managed to capture the essence of what we were going after within an hour and 50 minutes. It's a very complicated, challenging, daunting task. But we brought a lot of craft. You know, we, I had a really excellent editorial team. I bring my own sensibility, having directed almost 10 years in the TV industry. We have an excellent score, Nicholas Pike's uh, composition, performed by the Macedonian Radio Philharmonic Orchestra. We did this via Skype. We got them to perform this music because we needed a discount orchestra, frankly, and they were wonderful. I mean, we brought so many elements. We have still photographs. We have, we have um, uh, the... the um, the clips, the, the uh, short film, we have so much stuff, the voiceover work of my dad, the interviews from my dad throughout, you know, for, after, through decades really. We brought so much that we were able to cram in there and yet I think stay consistent, keep the pace going and make it not only uh, interesting but also entertaining. I think he'd be pleased. How can people see the movie? People can see the movie by going to see it, and they should if they can. On Friday, we open up uh, all across North America. The fact is we have pristine master copies of the original series, and to see it projected on the big screen is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I never get tired watching this film just because of that alone, those clips from the original series. So go to fortheloveofspock.com on our website. We have a list of all the theaters it's playing at across America, North America, really. Um, you can get it video on demand through iTunes, through Vimeo. We have a bunch of platforms that we have subscribed to um, that you can see it through. Uh, and I just, I hope people enjoy it. It's a celebration. It is not only mourning the loss of my father, Leonard Nimoy, um, but it's also a celebration of what he has achieved um, as an artist, as an actor, and celebrating the life and legacy of Mr. Spock. Absolutely. Adam, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations. Ricky, thank, thank you, you so much, man. Thank you. I appreciate it.